So good afternoon, friends. Um, many of the lawyers representing children fall far short of getting the best result for their child client. In fact, the courts and the agencies who are paying for this legal representation are often not getting their money's worth. The child's lawyer is potentially the most influential player in the entire court process, but the current system doesn't support these lawyers and fails to take good advantage of this most powerful role. Unless a lawyer enters the child's world, unless the lawyer understands this child and knows what he or she wants, what special tr uh, needs and interests this child might have, the lawyer is going to fall short of best representation of the child. Um, Entering the child's world means seeing the situation from the eyes of the child. It means understanding this child in this context and the best result for them. We've done research on this, and our research demonstrates that lawyers who indeed enter the child's world get a better result for the child. They, get, um, uh, they, they do a better job by the kids, and they help strengthen families. And our research also shows that Lawyers can be trained in the pathways to entering the child's world in as little as two days, as long as supported by uh, follow-up, peer follow-up and reinforcement. So today, I'm here to tell you about um, how these lawyers do it. How do they get better results for the child? I'm here to tell you how lawyers for children enter the child's world and how lawyers for children um, Keep the courts focused on the most important person in the whole process, and that is, of course, the child. Before I do that, I want to talk about two fallacies about child representation. One, lawyers and judges often say, you know, lawyers don't need to learn this stuff, like Judge Lederman was talking about, about child development, about cognitive, debe uh, uh, cognitive development in a child, um, family dynamics, that's soft, non-law, touchy-feely stuff. We should leave the social science stuff to, uh, to the psychologists and the social workers. Lawyers and courts, they had to deal with just pure law stuff. I'll leave the others to the, to, the, to, the, to the social science professions. Well, that's just not true. In every specialty of law, there's a significant body of knowledge and information that the a lawyer needs to know to function well beyond statutes and court rules. For instance, if you're representing a bank, you're going to know not only the statutes that govern, but you're going to know the uh, banking as a business and what they're doing uh, uh, fundamentally in the banking business. A lawyer representing a labor union, for instance, knows not only the case law, but he or she knows the traditions, the politics of the union, and their relationship to management. Our friends, medical malpractice lawyers, they pride themselves in knowing as much about the science um, uh, of their particular case and the medicine as do their expert witnesses um, and, uh, and the physicians. So, in child law is no different. Uh, in child law, unless you understand something about child development, trauma, its effects on the child, and what to do about it, you're not going to be doing a good job for your child clients. Now, the second fallacy is some lawyers say, I don't know about child representation. That's kiddie law. I don't want to do kiddie law. I want to do real law. Real law means moving money from one pocket to another. <laughs> real law means uh, talking with Supreme Court justices, not talking with little kids. Um, but that they're afraid that child representation isn't going to call upon their so-called higher intellectual powers. But that's just not true. Um, increasingly, the sophistication of child representation is becoming um, evident. L lawyers have to know not only the scientific, non-law stuff we've just been talking about, but they've got to draw increasingly on traditional lawyer skills of statutory construction, case analysis, developing a trial advocacy plan, doing appellate work on behalf of the child. So it's increasingly a challenging area. And child law is a relatively undeveloped area, so it's really a creates good opportunities to chart new ground for the lawyer that's entering the field. And 
you know, child law is one of the last great areas of civil rights law. Children, yeah, they're human beings. Children, in fact, are persons, and they're entitled to due process protections when their fundamental constitutional rights are at stake. So it's not just kiddie law, and it's, it's got considerable substance. And these kids need a voice. They need a voice who understands their needs and um, who understands the urgency of the situation, child's sense of time. And they need a voice of a person who has the skills to make a complicated governmental structure work properly. Lawyers who represent corporate clients get paid big bucks to help their agencies, their clients, navigate this complicated world of governmental and contractual agencies. A child caught up in the child welfare system deserves no less. So yeah, child representation has some unique knowledge and skills that the lawyer must acquire. Now I'm just going to have time to touch upon three of these very briefly. Uh, three of these pathways to entering the child's world. First is child development. The lawyer's got to know about a child's sense of time. Attachment and bonding dynamics, especially in the first four years of life. Trauma and loss and how that affects the child. Um, some of this stuff is mysterious to we lawyers. I remember my first experience with non-organic fail failure to thrive. Why isn't this baby growing? What can be done about it? And child development it doesn't happen in a linear step-by-step -step process. It happens more in fits and starts. Um, I remember Emily, 18 months old. Her grandparents used to take her to a favorite diner on a Saturday for breakfast. Emily was trying to, starting to get the rhythm of the thing. She was acquiring language. She'd order her eggy and toasty. <laughs> but, uh, a month after Emily was removed from her parents to stranger foster care, her grandparents took her back to the same place. She'd lost it. No language. She had no recognition of the place. So kids can lose ground, too. So let's talk about trauma and loss. Um, if the lawyer wants to enter the world of a child alleged to be abused or neglected, he or she's got to know about trauma and um, the effects of trauma on the child. Um, trauma is more than a, uh, a stressful experience. Trauma is a devastating blow to the child's psyche caused by some extreme event like physical or sexual abuse, um, like witnessing violence, and maybe in some cases being removed from the home. Research tells us that kids in foster care uh, show atypical levels of, uh, of, horm of stress hormones, such as cortisol. Mm -hmm. Trauma at any age can affect the brain. But trauma is especially uh, profound in early childhood. So, I'm remembering a little boy, depressed seven-year-old, lying in his bed. He uh, didn't want to play, he didn't want to watch TV. Um, at school, he was listless, un totally unengaged. Um, I remember him whispering to me from his bed, I have a brother. There's nothing more heartbreaking than a depressed seven-year-old. His brother, age nine, and he were very, very close. They'd been through a lot together. But the brother had a different dad and was now living with that father. Changing custody in this situation was not in the cards, but I persuaded the court to order uh, sibling visitation, including overnights, and that helped a lot. The experts will tell us that one of the uh, critical elements to deal with a kid who's uh, been traumatized is to keep them connected with the significant and safe persons uh, in, in their life. Now, one of the uh, most critical skills um, of uh, lawyers representing children is the ability to form trust and rapport with their client. Trust, after all, is the foundation for the youngster giving instructions that the lawyer needs as lawyer. And um, there's got to be some level of trust
for the child or youth to be able to accept the advice and guidance that the lawyer is going to give as the case unfolds. So how do you do this? How and where and when do you talk with the child? Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into some of the details um, of the, found, the, the fundamentals of forming this rapport relationship, but you know that it's key. I want to say just one thing. Give some time to building this relationship. Be patient. Um, developing a meaningful rapport and trust is going to take probably several contacts, several visits. So talk with your child client. Talk with them again. Um, stay in touch. Many lawyers for youth uh, text or, or phone and email with their, their youthful clients as a way to stay in touch. Now, all this really pays off. Um, at the end of the day, your, your advocacy for the child is going to be given clarity, force, and direction if you've spent this time developing the relationship and learning to enter the child's world. Um, some people say it saves time in the long run to have laid this particular foundation. Um, one of the lawyers in our study uh, had an eight-year-old client. And uh, she was a rather formal person, the lawyer was, and she preferred to see her clients in her office, maybe in the conference room next to the court. But she'd been in our training, we'd been talking about entering the child's world, and she thought, you know, what the hey, I'll just see this kid. The kid's in a, in a day camp, and I could just stop by. So she did. They had a great conversation. The little girl was so relaxed, she talked about her family, she talked about how things were going in the foster home. She talked about what she liked in the day camp. This formal lawyer was convinced. She said, I learned so much more from the child and about the child in that relaxed setting than I ever would in the more formal context of my office. And it gave her later advocacy so much more power. She said, I was able to build on that experience, draw upon from the depth of this familiarity to represent this little girl with depth and nuance that I wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. And that's been the experience of other lawyers that participated in our study. They say that entering the child's world gives force and uh, direction to their advocacy. Um, and uh, and um, when they act from that deeper knowledge and understanding of the child, it's so much more influential than if they're just the mouthpiece for the child, just repeating superficial kinds of things. One of the lawyers says, entering the child's world reminds me to step back and consider the situation from the child's perspective. So consider family Stabil connections. Consider home stability. Consider school. Consider um, the familiar routine for the child. And from that, try to fashion the legal remedies. That's the better way to go all the way around. So, um, you can do this at home. <laughs> uh, you can do this in your jurisdiction. You don't need statutory change. You don't need amendments to the court rules. A roadmap to this is available for free in our materials. This is really within your grasp. Um, but the lawyers need help. Um, a solo lawyer representing a child without organizational support cannot do this. Um, they need a little boost, a little help from their friends, if you will. And, uh, the lawyers need three things. They need to be paid adequately. They need to have time. They need to have time to enter the child's world. Time to um, do out-of-court problem solving and advocacy. Third thing they need, they need to be part of a peer-driven culture of learning so that they can maintain their advocacy skills and improve on their advocacy skills. This isn't going to cost a lot of money. And the benefit to the children and youth, to their families, and to the court process itself is going to be substantial. Indeed, you can do this at home. I wish you great success. Thank you. Thank you.